Welcome students to the first lecture for module 6. Now module 6 is the last lecture of the semester. So we're almost finished here. We'll cover two topics in this module. We'll talk about correlations and also regression. So uh, we'll first start off with this lecture talking about correlation. You've probably heard about correlations before, but we'll add a few new things to what you've learned previously, especially within a statistical context. So whenever we introduce a new test, we always ask the question, why? Why are we introducing this new test? We have several other tests already. So what does this new test give us that the others don't? And so we'll do the same thing here with correlations, and we'll talk about what correlations give us that our other tests, such as the Z, T, and the F tests, uh, do not. So the Z, T, and the F tests uh, use groups of individuals in their analyses. And so if you remember, we use groups to minimize the fact that people differ from each other. However, those differences are very meaningful. We know that people differ from each other, and they do so in, in, in meaningful ways. And so we lose that important variability of individuals. And so we can retain that individual variability by running correlations. Now the problem with that is that we now have a lot of individual differences and so there's a give and take whenever we look at our different statistical tests there's always advantages and disadvantages of, of each. But for correlations we're actually going to keep that variability. We're going to keep the fact that people differ from each other in our analyses. Now there are other reasons why we might do a correlational test other than the fact that we want to keep our data analysis at the individual level. One of those reasons may be that we can't reasonably assign to levels of the independent variable. So if you remember with a T and an F test, we would like to be able to randomly assign participants to conditions. Sometimes we can't do that, either because it's not possible or because it's not ethical. So for example, I can't randomly assign gender uh, in, my, in my studies. And so I can't have make someone, make a participant be female if they're male already for the purposes of my study. And so I have to take them as they come because I can't change particular characteristics of my participants. Another reason why we might want to do correlations instead of uh, a ZT or F test is because maybe we're just interested in exploring research opportunities. And so we're not really ready to do a full-blown experimental study. We just want to know, is there a relationship um, between our variables? And if there is, then it may be meaningful enough for us to actually put forth the resources to do a, a carefully designed experiment. Uh, the last reason that we'll talk about uh, might also be that we're only interested in external validity. And so we may only be interested in the fact that our results should generalize to a real population made up of individuals. And so I'll talk about external validity here in a second. External validity is sometimes called generalizability. So in other words, will we be able to generalize our results from our study or from our analysis to other people, situations, and locations? So, so far we've talked about inferring to larger populations uh, but sometimes you may want to infer to different populations or in some ki cases uh, different time periods or even different locations. So if we do a study in the south we may, we may want to generalize to uh, the population over in the west and so how well we can generalize or infer to a population in the west will be a measure of external validity. The other type of validity that we should be concerned about is called internal validity. Now internal validity is not so much interested in generalizability or inferring to other populations. It is rather concerned with what we call conclusiveness. So in other words, can we establish a causal relationship between variables? So in order to do this, we have to minimize all other possible explanations. And so if we can minimize all other possible explanations, then we can say that there may be a causal relationship between our variables. So if you remember, if we randomly assign to levels of the independent variable, then we equate our two groups on all possible characteristics except for the one that's being manipulated. That is a measure of internal validity. External validity, on the other hand, has to do with selection or how we select from a population. If we do so randomly, then external validity will be higher because we can then infer to the overall population. Now the thing is between external and internal validity is that they're often at odds with each other. 
that the higher your external validity is for your study, the lower your internal validity tends to be. And the vice versa is true as well, that the higher your internal validity is, the more that you minimize other possible explanations, the less externally valid your study tends to be. So we're always trying to balance external and internal validity. And so it's rare to have a study that is high on both. And so usually, like we mentioned before, that when you increase one, you decrease the other. Now correlational tests tend to be higher in external validity, whereas our Z, T, and F tests tend to be higher in internal validity. So you remember with those other tests, if we're using groups to minimize individual differences, well that doesn't really match reality very well because we know people differ from each other. So if we maintain the individual differences and in, let's say a correlational design, then we can increase the external validity. But again, that comes at a cost of the internal validity. That with correlations, there are always other possible explanations. Let's take a moment and let's talk about the basics of correlation. So I want to talk about two main points here. I want to talk about correlation as a research method design, and then I want to talk about correlation as a statistical test. So let's start with the research method design. So generally, when it comes to methods or designs of research studies, we usually can categorize them into one of two groups, either a true experimental design or a correlational design. Now a true experimental design reduces all other possible explanations. In other words, it's high in internal validity. And we do that by randomly assigning two groups. That if we can randomly assign, then we can say that our groups are equivalent on all possible explanations except for the one that we're interested in measuring. However, if we can't randomly design, so, I'm sorry, randomly assign, then we have to conveniently assign. And when we conveniently assign, the research design of our study is by default a correlational design. And that's even true if we're using a T or an F test. So for example, with gender studies, we can't randomly assign gender. People come as they are when it comes to gender. And because we can't randomly assign it, then by default, it's a correlational design, even though we're using a T or an F test. So if you see a T or an F test, and you want to know if it's an experiment or a correlational design, then you need to look for random assignment. If you have random assignment, then it's likely a true experimental design. If you have a convenient assignment, then it's likely a correlational design. Now let's talk about correlation as a statistical test. As a statistical test, all we're really concerned about is comparing a statistic, a correlation statistic, to a correlation critical value. And those are both measured using what's called a correlation coefficient. The correlation coefficient is a number and it has three main qualities. That correlation coefficient or that number is either positive or negative, so it can be a positive value or a negative value. It always falls between the values of negative one and one. So if you ever have a correlation coefficient that is greater than one or less than negative one, then you know you've done something wrong. And then finally, the strength of the correlation is measured by the magnitude not the sign of the correlation. So in other words, how large the correlation is or how large the number is, not by the sign whether it's positive or negative. Now that means that a correlation of negative one is just as strong as a correlation of one. In fact, the closer the correlation gets to zero, the weaker the relationship is. The closer it is to one or negative one, the stronger the relationship is. So let's take a look at an example of a positive correlation. Now this would be a perfect positive correlation of one. And so we have two variables here. We have the number of dollar menu items uh, at McDonald's that are purchased by customers. And that's on the x-axis. And then on the y-axis we have the cost and dollars of the transaction. And so if we look at our scatter plot here, we'll notice that there's several dots or points in the scatter plot. And so each one of those points is an observation. In this case, we're talking about people, so it's an individual person. And so in fact, it's what that person, the number of items that person's person purchases, and then the cost of that transaction. And so if we have a person who buys five items off the dollar menu, then they're gonna pay about $5 for that transaction. So this is a positive correlation, and what we mean by that is that as one variable increases, so does the, the values in the other variable. The reverse is true as well, that as values on one variable decreases, 
the values on the other variable decreases as well. So if we look at our, our x-axis, for if we look at the number of dollar menu items that are purchased, the more dollar menu items that are purchased, the higher the cost is going to be for the transaction. The reverse is also true that the fewer items that are purchased off the menu, the fewer the transaction is going, the less the transaction is going to cost as well. So that's a positive correlation. So if the values of the two variables are increasing together or decreasing together, then we're going to say that is a positive correlation. Here is an example of a negative correlation. Again, this is a perfectly negative correlation. What I mean by that is that the coefficient can't get any lower than negative 1. Now remember, a correlation of negative 1 is just as strong as a correlation of 1. So our two examples that we've talked about so far have equal strength. So in this particular example, we may have study hours, uh, as you see on the x-axis. Then we may have another variable called free time hours. And so these two variables are negatively related to each other. The more study hours that you spend studying, the fewer free time hours that you have. Uh, if you look at it from the other variables perspective, you can talk about how the increase in free time, hour, free time hours that you have decreases the number of study hours that you have. And so notice that the variables as one increases, the other decreases. And that's a negative correlation. Now let's take a look at another positive correlation that is not as strong as the one that we saw earlier. So here our correlation, the, the symbol for correlation is R, the correlation is 0.6. And so you'll note that the, the, the points in the graph don't fall in a straight line. In fact, they kind of scatter a little bit. And that's because there's particular amounts of error or what we might say individual differences. And so here we have two variables. We have doors knocked and candy bars sold. And so if you remember from a kid going around your neighborhood and selling candy bars for school, this may relate to that type of situation. And so you'll note here that generally, the more doors you knock, the more candy bars you sell. However, it's not a perfect correlation that not every door you knock on, you're going to sell candy bars. And that may be for several different reasons that are beyond the control of the person selling the candy bars. It could be the, the type of neighborhood that's in. It could be the personality of, of the, the child selling the candy bars. Uh, it could be how extroverted they are or introverted they are. So all those things create error or individual differences that keeps our correlations from being perfect. But generally, you can see that as doors knocked increases, so does the number of candy bars sold. And that's why it's a positive correlation, that you go from left to right on the graph, the values or the points, the data points, tend to increase uh, in a positive direction. Here's another example of a negative correlation. And so this might be a negative correlation of 0.6. So you see negative 0.6 uh, up there in the corner of the graph. And so maybe we're looking at two different variables. We're looking at the number of beers consumed and accuracy at beer pong. And so generally, we might have a negative correlation between these two variables, that the more uh, alcoholic beverages that are consumed, the less accurate someone might be at, at beer pong. Uh, the reverse is true as well, that the fewer uh, alcoholic beverages that are, are, are drank, then uh, the higher the accuracy is at, at Pong. Now, it's not a perfect relationship, but generally we see a, a decrease in motor control uh, as someone increases their consumption of alcoholic beverages, and so there tends to be a negative correlation between the two. Again, not a perfect correlation, but an overall trend that as uh, the increase in alcoholic beverages uh, consumed uh, increases, then the accuracy will decrease. Now, not only should we be concerned with the correlation coefficient, we also should be concerned about what we can conclude from correlational tests. And so we mentioned before that correlations are high in external validity, but tend to be low in internal validity. In other words, there tend to be many other explanations uh, for the variables that we're studying. And because there's these other explanations, it's hard for us to make a causal statement. And so you've probably heard about the phrase before that correlation does not equal causation. And so we should talk about correlation as not being a causal design, not being able to tell us much about the causal relationship between variables. For example, I've mentioned several times in class and also in emails that there's a relationship between 
a student's course grade and the number of absences they have in this course. And so that comes from a statistical test, a correlational statistical test. And so here we have our two variables of absences and course grade. And each point on this graph represents a student that's had this class in the past. And so here, there's 517 students in our graph. And so this has been over, over five semesters of just looking at students' final grade in the course and the number of absences that they've had. And so you'll notice, in general, there's a lot of variability, a lot of individual differences in, in course grades and also in absences. But you'll tend to notice that as we increase the number of absences, there tends to be a lower course grade in, in the class. Now, some students are still able to do well with, with a high number of absences. Uh, but in general, the more absences you have, the lower the grade is going to be in the course. And so this correlation is actually a correlation of negative 0.58. And so that's a significant correlation that it appears that as absences increase, the, the course grades tend to decrease. Now we can say the opposite uh, is true as well, that as course grades increase, absences tend to, to decrease. But we probably want to know what causes that relationship to exist between absences, uh, absences and grades. And so remember, with a correlation, we don't have a true independent variable. And because we don't have a true independent variable, we don't have random assignment. And so our internal validity is lower uh, in our correlational designs. So if internal validity is ruling out all other possible explanations for the relationship, and we're low in internal validity, then that means there could be several explanations for why this relationship between grades and absences exist. So we could conclude from our, our correlation that more absences cause lower grades. But the problem is that it's equally likely that we could say that lower grades cause more absences. In other words, students get their grades back from their assignments and exams, and that demotivates them in some way, and so they stop attending classes. And so because we don't have an independent variable nor random assignment, we can't distinguish between these two possible explanations. They both could be true. Now a third explanation that is equally likely as the other two is that both explanations may be true. So it isn't that absences cause lower grades or that lower grades cause more absences. It could be that both are true. So in other words, a student misses a few classes. They miss material that causes them to get lower grades on their exams. And then once they get their exams back and they have the lower grades, they're demotivated, and so they miss class more. And so all three of these explanations are all equally likely when we have a correlational design. But of course, there's at least one other possible explanation, and that is that neither are true. That more absences doesn't cause lower grades, nor lower grades cause more absences. In other words, there's another variable that we haven't measured that causes both. So an example might be course load, that the more, uh, more credit hours that a student takes may result in more absences because they have more on their plate, then also lower grades because they're dividing their attention among so many different courses. And so course load serves as a third variable that is responsible for both absences and lower grades. Another example might be uh, how many hours a student works outside of class. And so the more hours they work, uh, the more absences they may have and the lower grades they may have. And so there's an infinite number of other possible explanations that may explain the relationship between our two variables when it comes to a correlation. And that's why correlational designs uh, do not equal causal designs or correlation does not equal causation. There's always some other variable out there that might explain the relationship. So just remember that all four of these possible explanations are true. One variable may cause the other. The reverse may be true as well, both may be true, or neither could be true. There's a third variable or another variable that's causing that relationship to exist. Let's take a quick moment and let's look at the distribution for a correlational test. The correlation test, or the R test, is very similar to the T test. And so it's no surprise that the distribution looks very similar to a T distribution. The biggest change for a correlation distribution in comparison to a t-distribution is that the 
distribution actually touches the x-axis at two points on the continuum, and particularly at negative one and one. So if you remember, one of the qualities or characteristics of a correlation is that you can't get a correlation coefficient less than negative one or higher than one. And so the distribution, although it functions just the same as a t distribution, uh, it's a normal distribution, it's unimodal. Um, the biggest difference is that it's constrained at negative one and one and touches the x-axis at those two points.